Hey, it's Jordan. I am delighted to be joined by Adam Carlesco. Uh, you are a staff attorney uh, in the climate and energy uh, section of Food and Water Watch. And uh, there is a major Supreme Court decision. Uh, I have not seen it covered on CNN yet today. Shocker. Uh, but the Supreme Court ruled five to four, uh, in my view, uh, to greenlight the gutting of the Clean Water Act. Uh, more specifically, uh, it upholds a uh, Trump administration regulation uh, that essentially uh, makes it harder for states, tribes to enforce the Clean Water Act. Uh, in your view, what what is uh, tell the audience what exactly the Supreme Court ruled and the ramifications of that? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a case called Louisiana v. American Rivers. And uh, so it essentially deals with uh, Section 401 of the Clean Water Act provides states the authority to block uh, certification of projects that might impact their waterways. Um, namely, think of pipelines. Uh, a good example is the Northeast uh, Supply Enhancement Pipeline that was meant uh, to feed more gas into New York City. We we're gonna dig it under the Raritan Bay uh, and in doing so, it would upset a, a number of settled heavy metals and stuff like that uh, in an, an area that's starting to recover from the, the heavy degradation over the course of uh, industrialization in the US. And so this particular decision uh, blocks the Trump, uh, allows the Trump administration's regulations under this section to stay in place. And what that essentially did is it curbed a lot of state authority uh, to protect their waterways. Uh, in a particular way, it shortened timelines for review and kind of set a lot more tight, uh, top-down standards of how states need to addr address these sorts of issues uh, and decide what is best for their waterways under applicable state law. Uh, and it, the regulation went a little bit further and, and really kind of counteracted the case law that's already on the books, uh, saying that the EPA has authority to, uh, or the states have the authority to consider a variety of issues when it comes to certification of these pipelines, of these projects that might impact state waterways. Uh, some of them being uh, not just uh, water quality uh, standards, or uh, standards, which is uh, what the Trump administration had wanted, but also designated uses. Is this used for fishing? Is this used for such and such? Those would be considered in it as well. Uh, and uh, they really didn't look at the consideration of the anti-degradation policy, uh, which is also part of the Clean Water Act. So it really kind of constricts uh, state authority uh, for how these pipelines uh, get put into, uh, get certified by states. And before this, because I've reported in Flint, Indiana, North Carolina, I mean, there were already uh, violations of the Clean Water Act, uh, state to state. Uh, companies, I mean, Indiana in particular is one of the most polluted uh, states of the country. Uh, so although the Clean Water Act uh, does a lot of good things, uh, there's a lot of states uh, that, basically allow uh, corporate polluters to do whatever they want. So now you add this, uh, even for states that are a little stronger uh, in adherence to environmental regulations, uh, does this kind of tie hands uh, for state officials to protect the water and including tribes who obviously we know uh, a lot of these pipelines, uh, water contamination are going through native land, uh, black and brown communities. Uh, in many ways, it does kind of tie state hands. Uh, so they're really only able to look at certain levels of um, certain ways that water is polluted. So under the Clean Water Act, uh, you're supposed to be doing these sort of certifications for any sort of discharge that might result uh, from a project. So that could mean a lot of different things. However, the regulation that was put into place by the Trump administration narrows it down to a specific designated point source discharge uh, into a specific waterway. And so it, it kind of constrains how they would review these sorts of things. It really doesn't take into consideration state laws that might be more stringent uh, than the Clean Water Act is. Uh, and uh, yeah, it does look like they're trying to pull the kind of high achiever states down to a, a common lower level in, in many ways. Right. And also, you know, I think a lot of people because there was marketing behind the infrastructure deal and Biden was pushing that it's going to ensure clean water for, you know, all of America's children, this and that. Well, lead is not the only f form of water contamination. Actually, in Flint, uh, lead obviously poisoned the, uh, the whole community, but there was bacteria in there. There's PFAS, which uh, are 
cancer causing uh, chemicals that come from the manufacturing uh, process of Teflon. There's a whole lot of other contaminants <laughs> that the Clean Water Act is supposed to cover. I mean, I tweeted, you know, maybe I feel stronger that the Supreme Court just kind of ruled in favor of poisoning your water further. Uh, what are the ramifications, non-legal, but just health-wise, uh, that allowing this to happen uh, poses on people? Uh, it could really truncate uh, some of the environmental review that goes uh, forth by state agencies when they look at these projects. Uh, it could expedite uh, new infrastructure being dug in through uh, water bodies and the like uh, that could kick up whoever knows what, depending on, on which water body. Uh, and so, you know, it can have a, a serious effect going forward. It's only been in effect for, you know, a year and a half or so. The prior regulations were in place for 50 years. Um, I think concerning the Supreme Court case, one of the things that uh, I think stands out the most for me uh, in the decision itself was that this decision wasn't really a decision. It was one paragraph. It was an order. It was uh, in the emergency docket of the Supreme Court. So they're using somewhat of a this shadow docket uh, to more address substantive issues. This shows that they already think on the merits uh, that uh, that the Trump regulations were right and that the states are right. Uh, and not only that, the dissent, which is the only place that had any sort of substantive discourse about the decision, how they reached it, uh, was not only just uh, Sotomayor, Kagan, and, uh, and Breyer, but Chief Justice Roberts, a conservative appointed by Bush, saying that they, they boldly dissent because this not only uh, causes serious issues with uh, the, the merits of the case, but they are attacking the entire practice of having an agency voluntarily ask to have a regulation remanded to them. And the court saying that we need to, in the interim while you're reviewing this, this is going to go back to the regulations that have been there for 50 years. This court is making substantive decisions uh, in emergency orders where this doesn't belong. And I think that anyone other than kind of the, the more fringe right on the Supreme Court uh, are, are noticing that. Well, also, uh, it's unusual, right, that the majority that ruled in favor, five to four, didn't even issue an opinion? No opinion. It was uh, a paragraph that essentially described what they were uh, ordering, and that's it. They didn't even want to stand to justify uh, this kind of extraordinary, extraordinarily procedurally wrong sort of behavior from a judiciary body. Right. And I know you're a lawyer, but can you can you get into like what would be the basis of deciding this? Because we know it's the Supreme Court. So, I mean, it's a huge uh, lobbying industry uh, just to get these Supreme Court nominees appointed. A lot of the uh, conservative ones are all for deregulation and this and that. But I mean, they have to drink the water, too. I mean, what is what is the what is the thinking behind? Is it to speed up uh, business projects to deregulate. So, you know, Dow Chemical and uh, all these uh, chemical fossil fuel companies can, you know, have carte blanche to do whatever they want. I can't necessarily speak to that, but I do know that there are broader legal implications here. Uh, and I think that the justices are considering that because what had happened in the district court level is the district court had said, um, the EPA had told them after the Biden administration had come in that we would like to remand this rule. Essentially, send the rule back to us. We'll review it. In the interim, it will kind of stay in place uh, and we'll, we'll probably scrap it and put something new in in a couple of years. We can't get to it until 2023. And essentially what the judge said is that the prior rules have been in place for 50 years. Uh, the fact that you're willing to have this remanded to you for review shows that you probably don't think it's legal. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and vacate that, put in the regulations that have been in place for the past 50 years. And uh, so that was kind of a bold thing. The Ninth Circuit uh, uh, Court of Appeals, which is where the Northern District of California is, where the, the case underlying the Supreme Court decision was, hadn't come to a, a concrete decision as to how you deal with this procedural issue. Um, and so the district judge looked around the rest of the districts and saw that a lot of people were, were vacating uh, when a remand was requested. So uh, he essentially stopped the rule in place, put it in the, the old rules that had been in place for 50 years. And uh, now the Supreme Court is looking at this and saying, wait a second, I don't know if we necessarily want these rules to be stopped in the interim. If, if, 
if we're having something like a, a large dam or some sort of large infrastructure running through that's got a useful life of 50 years, and we got, say, this two year, three year span to get the certification done and these things installed, then, all right, let's uh, let's say that vacature and put the, the Trump rule back in place. We'll get those things certified up to that point. Uh, and then uh, under these more stringent rules and uh, procedurally stringent rules of the Trump administration. Uh, and uh, those things will get completed. And in the interim, you know, who knows what the Ninth Circuit might reach. But it also, I think in some ways, is indicating that the Supreme Court knows how they're going to rule when they grant cert uh, to this petition when it comes up to them. And also, how does this impact environmental impact studies? Because for those that remember the Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, one of the reasons uh, President Obama, very late in the game, by the way, uh, denied the permit was an, a proper environmental impact study was not done, which is supposed to be done for major infrastructure pro uh, uh, projects. And, and an environmental impact study would also be looking at the effects of these projects on the water. Uh, does this uh, Does this ruling further uh, weaken or enable, uh, you know, pipeline builders or other projects to get around environmental impact studies? Yeah, it does. So the 2020 rule that was put out by the Trump administration uh, essentially said that certifying authorities within states uh, cannot delay uh, a decision based upon whether or not there's a NEPA review done. They said that the NEPA review is much broader than what you have to rule on here. So you don't have to look at the entire environmental impact of this project. We just need you to decide if under your state law, this discharge into this specific body of water uh, violates your clean water standard uh, based upon the criteria of you know, how much mercury is in this water or something like that, uh, but nothing else. And it doesn't just uh, include uh, non-designated um, pollutants. So you can have heat, you can have, uh, you know, a large volume of water coming and changing an ecosystem. Uh, and they're saying, don't look at those sorts of things. So by them kind of not allowing states to do their NEPA review until after the fact uh, allows a lot of states not to have sufficient information when they have to make these decisions. And can I just ask you lastly, this is not a legal question, but, um, you know, uh, the media for a long time, not so much anymore, was covering COVID as a crisis. Obviously, it was a crisis. I think it's still very uh, serious. Uh, but you don't really see much attention to water <laughs> contamination or the threat against water. Last time I checked, that's the number one necessity in life, uh, clean water. Uh, you can't go long without uh, consumption of water. As a lawyer, uh, does, does it frustrate you uh, that this isn't I mean, obviously, people aren't dying in the thousands every day, but slowly, I mean, contamination has been linked to cancers and other illnesses uh, in the Ohio River Valley uh, many years ago. A lot of people died uh, due to PFAS. Um, uh, chemical companies were slapped with hundreds of billions of dollars in fines. Um, can you kind of talk about just where where is the media urgency on this? I think the media is not necessarily paying attention to some of these things because they're chronic issues. And chronic issues don't necessarily garner the same attention as something that flares up and then comes right back down. Uh, you can't really get, you know, add time on things when it's about, hey, look, here's an underlying infrastructure issue that exists in our country. And here are the regulatory faults with how it's being managed. Uh, it's C-SPAN material. And that's not what major news networks are selling. They're selling fast paced, quick fire, uh, loud nonsense in between commercial breaks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Adam, uh, from uh, Food Water Watch. Uh, we'll stay in touch on this. All right. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching. And make sure to tune in to Status Quo's daily live stream Monday through Thursday at 5 o'clock Eastern Time and Fridays at 4 o'clock Eastern Time.